Hello, I think we're live. Um, hi, everybody. So this is the Metaprogramming Workshop, Introduction to Metaprogramming at JuliaCon 2021. This is the last workshop of JuliaCon 2021 uh, on Tuesday, the 27th of July, 2021. Tomorrow, it's very exciting that the actual JuliaCon talks will start. But uh, we've had some great workshops so far. and. Um, so this is the last one of the set. Unfortunately, the other workshop that was planned for today is uh, not uh, able to happen uh, for health reasons, but um, uh, this one is still going ahead. <clears throat> OK. So on the bottom here, you can see, hopefully, this banner, which uh, tells us, uh, tells you where you can get the materials for this workshop. So let me show you that. If you go to that link, you should see. Uh, now I need to share my screen. Share, share screen. Just a minute. Share screen. Okay, now it's over here. So I cannot see. Uh, how do I see what you're seeing? I guess I have to go to YouTube over here. this at the minute David if you switch over the screen this at the minute to yep that one that's what you want that looks awesome okay I just wanted to actually see be able to see I see okay yeah to, so let me yeah, share that my one that's what you want that looks I, awesome. okay so let me grab okay. this and I bring it over here so let me share that. Okay, so okay, so hopefully you can now see the <clears throat> link on GitHub with the materials. So the materials are actually Jupyter Notebooks, um, but you don't need the Jupyter Notebook to see the materials. You can just go to the link that I was about to paste into the README. Oh, not that one. Sorry. Distracted at a key moment. Okay, here we go. So you can now see this link will take you to NB Viewer, and there you can actually see the the notebooks just by clicking on them. So for example, here's the first notebook. OK, so let's get started. So I'm going to go back to this sort of table of contents, actually. So as I said, I'm going to be using the Jupyter Notebook. Actually, I'll be using the new version, well, it's not so new anymore, called Jupyter Lab. And so um, let's just look at this, this outline of the workshop. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, slightly nervous. OK, let me close all of these just for a minute. OK, so uh, we are actually going to, yeah. <clears throat> so this is an introduction to metaprogramming. So we're going to start off with what is metaprogramming. Uh, that's in notebook one. Then we'll look at how is a piece of code actually structured in Julia, and in particular, expression trees. Then macros, which is this sort of subject that people uh, find difficult, and it is difficult, but I'll try and simplify it as much as I can. And how we can do code generation using eval and some of the pitfalls, problems that we might arise with that. And we'll look at generated functions um, briefly, which is uh, useful in very specific circumstances. And I'll finish off by um, just pointing out some alternative methods and some adva more advanced tools for metaprogramming. 
And I should start, so let's start with this, uh, this initial notebook, which is number zero, resources. So, um, you know, this is one workshop, but there are now actually quite a few very useful resources on metaprogramming in Julia. And, um, okay. And so there's, of course, the section of the Julia manual on metaprogramming. This is actually very useful. It's very well written. But some of it maybe is not quite so accessible to, a, so let's say, a beginner. So this is a, really a workshop for people who have not done metaprogramming with Julia before, but they already know, you know some reasonable amount of Julia, um, but just no metaprogramming. So I'm going to be starting from, zero, from scratch, from zero. And then there's this wiki book called Introducing Julia that has a nice section on metaprogramming. There's this Julia tutorial, uh, RIP Julia tutorial, again, has some useful bits of information on metaprogramming. Now, uh, if you don't know this keynote talk by Stephen Johnson, who's a uh, professor at MIT and very active Julia contributor, he gave a fantastic keynote talk uh, two years ago at JuliaCon that I really highly recommend about sort of what is metaprogramming, some great examples of actual metaprogramming in actual use and when not to use metaprogramming. Andy Ferris gave a workshop uh, also at JuliaCon uh, about metaprogramming, uh, but the content of that workshop does not really cover what I'm going to cover today, but it has excellent information about how the Julia compiler works and um, sort of how, again, how sort of not to do metaprogramming or how, how you can do, you know, advanced things in Julia with higher order functions, et cetera, without actually doing the kind of metaprogramming that I'll be talking about today. I wrote a blog post um, for the Julia blog on using macros for domain specific languages, and I'll be going over that a bit today as well. And Tom Kwong has an excellent video about macros and macro hygiene. That's uh, very nice. And he actually has a whole book on design patterns and best practices with Julia that I highly recommend. OK, so let's get started. And then, then I've just got a list of some of the more advanced packages that I'll come to later. OK, so let's get started with um, notebook number one, uh, Introduction to Meta Programming in Julia. So I'm. Uh, my name is David Sanders. I'm a professor at the Facultad de Ciencias, the Faculty of School of Sciences at the National University of Mexico, UNAM, in Mexico City. And recently, I've been visiting the Department of Mathematics and the Julia Lab at MIT and working with Alan Edelman and his group. And uh, so basically, I've been using Julia for about seven years or more now. And uh, I've written various Julia tutorials and Julia packages uh, to do with uh, interval arithmetic and related subjects. <clears throat> OK, so that's uh, just a bit of background. So now, what is metaprogramming, actually? So Stephen Johnson, in his keynote that I already talked about, gave a very nice, succinct definition, which is high-level code that writes high-level code. So what is that about? So what is this meta word in metaprogramming? Well, the word meta, coming from the Greek, uh, just means sort of above in Greek, but in English it's, it's taken on this meaning of something on a higher level. So metaprogramming means, as Stephen Johnson said, higher level programming. What does that mean? It means writing code. Sorry. So we, we're actually writing code, in other words, a program, but that program is going to manipulate other code. Normal programming. In normal programming, we write a piece of code, and that code manipulates data. But in metaprogramming, we're going to write some code that actually generates other code so that that code can then manipulate data. OK. OK, so please post the link in the chat. Good idea. Uh, I'll try. So I'll try to uh, be reading the, the, uh, the chat, and then we'll have these questions on pigeonhole. And I forgot to. Um, get the pigeonhole link. So let me just let me get that.
here's a pigeonhole link. I just posted it in the YouTube chat. And then the link to the materials are here. And a minute. Um, sorry. Sorry about the technical uh, difficulties trying to handle everything. Just a minute. Oops. Why is that doing that? Oh my goodness. Oh, I see I had another window open. Okay. A moment to check if somebody was trying to get my attention. I can't actually see it. So, so again, what is metaprogramming? OK, so we already covered that. So why do we actually need metaprogramming? And uh, you know, the short answer is that we do not actually ever really need metaprogramming at all. Everything that we can do with metaprogramming can be done in principle without it. But what metaprogramming is there for is to make our life easier. And basically, it does that by being able to automate the generation of repetitive bits of code. So this is often called boilerplate code. So here's a very simple example. Suppose we have a variable called my long variable, and we wish to display the value and the name of the variable. So we're defining this variable, and then you know, how would I print out you know, in some debugging session within a piece of code, how would I actually print out the name and the value? I would have to do print line my long variable equals and then my long variable. And I run that, and it prints out my long variable equals three. But of course, it's annoying the fact that I have to type both of these things, you know, type the same thing twice. Basically, you know, there's this idea in computer science, DRY, don't repeat yourself. And um, uh, so we don't want to repeat this. And I, sorry, I just realized that I wanted to. Let me close this again. Sorry, I'm going to. So yeah, so there will be live. Um, there will be questions during this workshop that I want you to answer, and then I'm going to answer them after you try and answer them uh, with basically some kind of live coding. And so what I'm going to do is actually make a new version of all this, uh, of this whole workshop in a new directory um, and actually work from that live version of the notebook and then upload those live notebooks after the session. So now, uh, here's my live one, and I want to be working on the live version of this notebook. OK, OK, now we're in business. OK, so here we go. So yeah, so we've got this my long variable equals 3. And um, that, that works. OK, so of course, we, what we can do is write a function called my show, uh, which takes in some argument y. And we can print out the, the value is, and then interpolate the value of y into that string. 
And if we do that, for example, let's suppose we define A equals one and B equals two. Um, and we can do my show of A plus B and the function will receive the value of A plus B, which is three. And so it will print out the value is three. But if we want to know, you know, the value of whom, whose value is actually three, that's what we would like to know. And um, that's what we, we can't actually see. So um, that's, that's annoying. And OK, so it receives, the function receives only the value. So what is the solution to this problem? We cannot actually do this in Julia using functions. There are some strange languages like R where strange things happen, and maybe you could do it using a function. But actually, in Julia, the solution is to use a macro. This is a very different thing from a function, a very different kind of beast. In some sense, you can think of it as a sort of super function, but that's probably not actually a good, uh, either mathematically it's a kind of function, but it, it takes in something and it spits something else out. But it works in a very different way. It's a very different animal. Okay, so uh, you probably know that macros are indicated with the at symbol. So there's always this indication that, that you are, you're, you're using a macro, a visual indication with the at symbol that tells us that something weird is happening. Okay. Something different, something strange. Uh, basically, a macro can almost do anything that it wants. And so you should be aware that something strange is happening and that this is not sort of normal Julia. Uh, okay, so at show, why? will actually do what we want. It prints out the, the name of this object and then the value. So for example, I can use it also for a whole expression and it will print out that the name of this expression, or, or, or rather sort of just the whole expression itself, a plus b and then equals, and then the value that it evaluates to when I, you know, as if I had typed this straight into the console. So in some sense, we see that the macro actually has access to the name of or the expression that you're passing in. And that is what macros in general do. They get access to this whole expression and they can do something with it. In this case, it's not doing anything very interesting, but, but we'll see that um, macros can do basically arbitrary things to pieces of code. So what a macro does is it takes in a piece of code and manipulates it in some way and it spits out a new piece of code. And that new piece of code is actually what Julia will run. It was, it's actually what Julia will compile and then run. So what a macro is doing is taking this piece of code, manipulating it, and replacing this new piece of code that it generated instead of, in place of, the old piece of code. And uh, so this new this process of generating new code is, or making new code is called, often called code generation. And that is the, the role of a macro in a way. Okay, so how do I know what this macro is actually doing? Well, there's a very useful command, at macro expand. You'll see that because it has an at, you know that it itself is a macro. It's a bit self-referential, but anyway, um, you just put at macro expand in front of the expression involving the macro, and it will print out a piece of code. So this quote end, we'll see later, is a way of making a piece of Julia code inside Julia. And here is the piece of code that it's printing out. So the first time you see this, it's pretty confusing. It's not clear what's going on. So one of the things that's confusing is that there's this line number information inserted inside this piece of code that got generated. Excuse me. And that is telling us which line in the Julia source code this code was created at. And so you can see that this was in the show.jl file at line number 955. And this is a comment, right? And so um, that does not actually have any bearing on the actual code that gets generated. And often we want to just remove all of those line number in pieces of information. And base Julia has a function called remove line nums exclamation mark or bang. Um, and you just pass in this piece of code and it will remove all of those line numbers. And so this is the actual code that's being generated. So you can see that it sort of looks like, oh yeah, it looks like a print line. It's printing uh, the name of Y and then it's assigning a local variable with a strange name. It's like a generated name, a sort of unique identifier that got generated. 
it's assigning that local variable to be equal to y, and then it's returning that local variable. So you can see that the macro is doing something clever with this local variable. Um, that's in order to not step on any, any toes of any other variables in the code. That's called macro hygiene. Okay, so let's not get too into the details of what exactly is going on here. Let's just look at another example. So you're used to using the at time macro. Uh, that, what does that do? Given this piece of code, it runs that piece of code, but such that it also sets up a timer before you run the code, and then it, then you run the code, and then you you know uh, finish the timer and calculate the time difference between when you started and stopped the timer. And so in this case, well, it's very fast. Um, so in this case, you know usually you would use uh, benchmark tools. Um, and you would use at b time instead. That would run the code many times. And then uh, there's this issue with um, so often it gives you the zero nanoseconds. And when it does that, that means that the compiler was able to compile everything away. And so instead of that, you have to do this strange uh, dollars ref bracket trick, uh, which is very annoying. And when you do that, you see um, that. Actually, apparently, calculating this exponential takes 17 nanoseconds. That seems long to me. I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe we'll do x equals 1 ref x instead. Maybe that's more useful. OK, no, apparently, that's taking a long time. Not quite sure what, why that is. Uh, 1.0, maybe, so it doesn't have to convert it. Yeah, it was had to convert it from an integer to a floating point number, and that is actually half of the time. OK, so what is that doing? Here is, you know, again, the macro expand of this time macro. So you can see that inside there somewhere, it's calculating x of 1. So again, you know, what we don't want is a function where you pass in x of 1. That's a value. Um, so by the time you pass x of 1 into a function, it has already evaluated x of 1 and gives you this number 2.7 something. And so you cannot actually, you know, run the code anymore. So what it has to do is take the piece of code itself, and here's the piece of code repeated, and then it puts some extra code around it. And that's this boilerplate code. Basically, this is this code to start and stop timers. That's the same exact code that you're going to have to write every single time you want to time a piece of code. And I, as a user, I'm going to get very bored if I have to keep on writing that same piece of code every time I want to time something. So this is the, the way to time code in Julia. And again, you can see that I got these local variables with strange names. Yeah. OK. So, um, so by the way, you can also just do at edit at time x of 1. So that will actually take me to my editor. So let's look at that. Here is my editor. No, I can't see it. I'm having trouble working out how to. Here's my editor, and here is the definition of the at time macro. So you can see that what's happening is here somehow is the, the expression that's being passed in, and the value is equal to the, the, this expression. And then we're having these local variables around it, which are calculating the time. And um, if we go back to this output of at macro expand, you can see that that's basically what you can see, except that all of these local variables have been changed into these strange generated names. OK, so we're going to look at, as I said, the details of this later. OK, so let me pause and look to see if there are any. Um... OK, let me try and find the questions on pigeonhole. So we're using this pigeonhole link that I posted in the chat, in the YouTube chat, chat to um, actually uh, for you to ask questions. OK, yeah. Um, so I should have shared the GitHub repository beforehand. Sorry about that. Uh, something about generated functions that we'll talk, do later. Uh, there's a while false end in the macro expand. Uh, yes, there is. I have no idea why that's there. Good question. That's actually in the uh, original source code. 
it says it's a compiler heuristic, compile this block, alter this if the heuristic changes. Uh, so that's just some kind of uh, the kind of kind of strange uh, instruction to the compiler, apparently. Yeah, good question. Not sure. Someone put the link for the GitHub site. Yeah, okay, it's 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 up there in one of the other questions. Okay, thanks for the for those uh, tips. Okay. So that's one example of the use of macros. Uh, now let's uh, look at a, a very big class of usages of macros, and that is domain-specific languages. So what does that mean? It means that you might want to write a sort of mini language that makes it easier to create objects in your domain. So domain here means something like, uh, in my case, it might be something like uh, uh, scientific programming. I mean, uh, some kind of, so I'll get, actually give an example. And the example is this catalyst.jl package. So what does that do? It's a way, a package that is written so that you can easily specify a collection of chemical reactions. And you're gonna specify those reactions in a way that a chemist would actually understand. So a chemist will write things like this, A, arrow B, and B, arrow A. That means that there's some chemical species A that gets changed into, that can change into a, a different chemical species B. And that happens with a certain rate, K1. And then B changes to A with a different rate, K2. And so this is exactly the way that a chemist would talk about this set of reactions using this notation. But Julia, of course, does not understand this notation. This is not Julia code. Julia code, what would Julia code do? It would have some Julia object called a reaction network object. And then you would pass in you know, information into that object. And so the point is that we want to use this nice syntax that a domain expert, a person who understands chemistry would use to write down their equations. And then we want to translate that into some actual Julia code. And that is one very important usage of macros. So I, I, uh, I just put the output of this package so that you don't need to install it, but of course you can, you can easily install it from in the usual way with the package manager in Julia. And so what happens if I run this piece of code? Mm. If I define network equals this object, this thing, I actually get out this, this, this output. It's defined, so it has defined an object of type reaction system. So as I said, that's, you know, a Julia, oh, sorry. I can't uh, double click. There's a Julia object, a Julia type, and we need to pass information into that type. And so you can see that it has set up a model of this type inside which are contained two equations. And it has states A of T and B of T. T is the time. So these are functions of time, the concentration of A in basically the number of molecules of A in the system at time T, and it has these parameters K1 and K2. And then you can pass this object into some other um, piece of the system to then simulate this system either as differential equations or as um, stochastic um, molecules bouncing off each other uh, and reacting. So what does this, this macro actually do? It takes in this piece of something that looks like Julia code, and it expands it to this massive beast. So what we're seeing here is it's using this symbolics package. It's using this modeling toolkit package. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about symbolics a bit later. It basically just allows you to use these symbolic variables. So here we're de actually defining symbolic variables, T, K1, and K2, and then we're it's doing something else. And then here is where it's actually generating this reaction system and passing in all of these complicated things that the author of the package knows need to be in that object. But the user does not want to have to worry about what is actually going on inside that. Object. So we see that the macro has actually done a lot of work in converting this symbolic, nice, high level description into the actual Julia code that needs to be run with all of these extra parameters that the the, the again, to, so this is a way of separating the user from the package developer and, and trying to make it easier to, for the user to use the package by removing some of the burden of writing this sort of boilerplate code. Just note that there is, though, a limitation on what we can, which syntax we can actually use inside macros. 
So for example, um, here, you know, what do we have? We have something comma something. That is something that we can write in Julia. And we have this long arrow that, that, that is a symbol that you can define in Julia actually. But for example, here's an example of something you could not do. In mathematics, we often want to write something like x equals opens, open parenthesis a comma b close square bracket. And this means an interval from a to b, which does not include a, but does include b, a half open interval. We might want to write that in Julia, but it turns out that even inside a macro, we cannot write that because the parentheses are not balanced. And Julia requires parentheses to be balanced. And so that is built into the Julia parser itself. So there is actually no way to write this in a, inside a macro. There is a solution. If you want to write things like this, you can actually use what's called non-standard string literals. So that's a kind of string where you can control how the string is parsed. I'm not, not going to talk about those today. I put a link to the Julia manual. Um, so yeah, so that's what, what we do. Okay. And so we also need to discuss when should we not use metaprogramming. This is a very important point that you should often actually not use metaprogramming and metaprogramming might not be the right tool. So for example, we'll see later that if we have a piece of code like x times y, we'll see how we could actually replace the times inside that code with a plus. However, Julia is powerful enough to be able to do this in some circumstances without really using the tools that we're, we're looking at today. So here's an example. Here's a function which takes in three things, an x, a y, and something called plus, and it returns x plus y. And so, okay, we can definitely pass in the standard Julia plus function into that function, and then we'll get, you know, um, we will indeed get, get three plus four, but actually we can pass in times instead. And so what's happening here is that um, you know, plus here is just a name for this argument to the function, <clears throat> this formal parameter of the function. <clears throat> and here I'm actually passing in Julia's times function, and that will be used as this plus operator. And so instead of x plus y, I'll get x times y. Similarly, I could do f of three comma four comma max, and I'll get the maximum of three and four instead. Okay, so that seems like a pretty nice solution. But now let's think about a more complicated piece of code where we have several of these operators, x plus y minus z divided by w times t. We have you know, all of the four arithmetic operators in that expression. And so what we would have to do is sort of write this function and have all of these four operators, one after another, as arguments to the expression and then um, pass them all in. Um, so it just starts to get complicated. Of course, you can do it, but it just gets cumbersome. And so you probably want to find a different solution and metaprogramming is one solution, one possible solution. This is actually a hard problem. How do you take a piece of code and replace things inside that piece of code? And there are various solutions that have been developed in the Julia ecosystem. For, for example, cassette.jl, irtools.jl, um, which tend to work at a lower level than this, this level. Okay. So that is actually the end of this first, um, first notebook. So I'm gonna pause to take questions and to close the window. Okay, doesn't seem to be, don't see any more questions. Okay, there's a, a, an interesting question here. Does a macro always add code before and or after the code following it, i.e. not in between? Okay, that's a great question. So we'll see that, no, a macro can actually do whatever it wants to the code. So uh, yeah, so an example, a good example will be this take x plus y, that's the input code that I'm passing into a macro, and I'm just going to replace it with x times y. So it's actually manipulating things in the middle of the code. So we can add things before the code, after the code, it can just you know, rewrite the code completely. Could you use some Unicode character in place of the plus? Good question, let's try that. Um, so I'm gonna use O plus, backslash O plus tab, that gives me this. Um, Okay, 
Yeah, and then that will work perfectly fine. That's a, a, actually a good idea, thanks. Yeah, that's a good idea, So, but it doesn't look like it has to be the Julia plus function. It looks like, oh, there's some operator there, some weird operator. Oh, I'm passing in an operator to the function. Yeah, great, great idea. I don't actually know how to get rid of these comments on pigeonhole, so. Um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah, another great question. F3, 4 max evaluates correctly, right? Just trying to calculate the maximum of three and four. And the question is, how does it know what to do? Because um, if I type three max four, that seems to be what's going on here, right? Three and then the operator, which is max, and then four, that seems to be what's happening, but that's actually an error in syntax error in Julia. So the answer is very interesting. So what is X plus Y in Julia? What does that actually mean? Okay, I don't have an X and a Y, well, okay, whatever, three plus four. So what does that actually do in, in Julia? It's actually equivalent to writing plus of three, four. So plus is just a function and I'm passing in two arguments, three and four. <clears throat> this is totally equivalent. This is immediately, if you like, replaced with this. We'll actually see that later. Um, and so, so this bit of code um, is actually doing max brackets 3 comma 4 or you know this is the same i could just write this as o plus of x comma y maybe that's actually more uh clearer right thanks um the non-standard string literals are also just macros with an underscore str yes uh so what is a non-standard string literal it's something like this Oh, come on. Here's an example of a non-standard string literal uh, big of 0 0.1. So what does that do? It takes the string 0 0.1 and interprets it as a big float. It parses it to a big float. And I get the big float with the default precision, which is 256 bits, 0 0.1, and we see that there's some problem, I can never represent 0 0.1 exactly in big root. And so um, this is, as uh, the questioner says, equivalent to writing at big underscore string of the string 0 0.1. Is that right? Or even without the string? No, yeah, you need the string. Yeah, so this is a kind of macro. That's true to point. Yeah, it's a kind of macro, but it's, um, it, it's special because it only works on strings. The other macros work on pieces of Julia code that we're about to um, understand. Okay, okay, this is a good question. What are the benefits of using metaprogramming in the case of chemical reactions instead of passing a string with, so I could have passed, sorry, I could have passed a string with sort of K comma A goes to B. Yeah, so that's a, a good question. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a sort of always a tension. Uh, I think I would say that one of the advantages is that it actually provides some, so you are actually using the Julia parser. And so it's actually providing you with some information. For example, if you get the syntax wrong, it will complain, right? So, um, So let me try and actually run this code. Oh, I can just load the catalyst right here. So let's run this code and we'll see that it, it, it gives me the output of this um, of this. It gives me the output that I copied above. It takes a while to load because it's, you know, as usual, pre-compiling something the first time. Um, in Julia, the first time that we run any piece of code is, is often compiling various functions, and then the next time it will be fast. So uh, there we go. Okay, and it even printed out in this beautiful way. That's pretty nice. I hadn't actually done it inside the notebook before. That's uh, that's that's pretty nice. Yeah. And so um, so what I was going to say was, okay, if I actually make an error with the syntax, suppose I put an extra comma here. Okay, then I actually. Well, in this case, I actually get something different. It seems to ignore the, the second one. But suppose I um, do you know, some other piece of syntax 
you know, uh, okay, in this case, it's malformed reaction. So that is actually coming from the catalyst itself. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I have to say, I don't have a particularly good answer to that question. Um, it's just always the fact that you are within sort of Julia. Yeah, so macros is sort of a way of escaping from uh, being actually working in Julia. And you, you're sort of defining your own. This is basically what we're doing here is sort of defining our own extra syntax to add on to Julia. And um, so that has the downside that basically you as the package author are responsible for parsing this and converting it into your favorite, you know, your, your these these um, these objects that exist in your package. So you actually sort of you're you've sort of given up some of Julia's help, and you give up even more of that help if you use strings instead of actual Julia expressions because Julia cannot do the parsing for you. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have a great uh, great answer to that question. If anybody else has a, a better answer, I'd be very interested to hear it. Okay. Um, does Julia use applicative order evaluation? I don't know what that means. I presume it's something to do with um, the order of precedence of operations, and that uh, I'll mention later. Um, are macros compiled every time you call them, or are they being cached? If I call two times the at time macro, the first time will be compiled and the second time. So I guess they are being compiled each time because, uh, yeah. So let's see. Uh, so how could I see that? So I could actually do at time, at time x of 1. Uh, I'm timing, you know, doing at time x of one. And what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of allocations, but I'm not seeing that it's actually being compiled. I don't know, maybe that means that it's actually being compiled. I'm pretty sure that it has to compile it each time because, you know, if I now change this to sine of one, it's actually a different piece of code that's being compiled, right? Because it's now the same block of code, but it has a sign instead of an exponential. So it must be being compiled each time. Yeah, but macros are at compile time. So, um, so once you've compiled this macro, you just have a piece of Julia code, and then that Julia code will be run each time. Okay. Uh, yeah. So can you treat can can so if I do if I do a op b, can I force uh, you know this is an operation? Can I force Julia to treat op as an what this is called an infix operator? And so there is a package. That that does tricks to do to do that. Um, uh, it's a very neat package, uh, but it's sort of silly. At the same time, uh, I don't remember what the package is, and I don't can't find it immediately. So um, yeah, Julia does not have an equivalent to Lisp reader macros. I don't know what those are, so I can't say. Can can we say a macro is similar to a decorator? That's a Python concept. If not, what are the differences? I, I never really learned decorators, um, so I can't really comment on that. But basically, uh, I think a macro is more general than a decorator, if I remember correctly. Why is a line number in the Julia source code in a macro? I already mentioned that. Uh, maybe I didn't mention why it's there. It's there so that you can more easily debug your macros. Macros are actually hard. Metaprogramming is difficult to do because code is being created from nowhere, and you don't know where that code is being created. And so these line numbers are very useful. If you have some macro that's not doing what you think, it is actually telling you, oh, this line came from this place, and this line, the line came from this other place. So that's actually very useful. OK, I think I've covered all the questions. There are new questions. Do you? Um, OK, I think I've answered all the questions. Fantastic. Thanks. Great questions. Let's move on. Structure of code. So this is the next notebook, number two, structure of code. OK, so the whole point is that Julia can actually talk about Julia code from within Julia. So this is some kind, sometimes called homo-iconicity. Um, so let me, this is sometimes called homo-iconicity. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty annoying word. 
because it doesn't really tell me what it means. So anyway, whatever. It just means I can actually have a Julia object that represents a piece of Julia code and then use that in Julia to do something. Okay, so that's what we're going to see in this notebook. Okay, so um, so there's actually an exercise. So I'd like you to do this exercise to, to learn how this works. Uh, many people probably have already seen this. Uh, just do it quickly and then I'll, I'll do it um, live. Okay, so define a variable code to be the result of parsing the string j equals i squared. So parsing means converting a string into a piece of code. And how do we do that? We use the function meta.parse. Meta is a standard library um, in Julia. And so you can just call it. We don't need to import anything. Yeah, I didn't say that. Um, basically, none of what I'm going to say, almost none except these sort of extra packages, Everything else you can just do from any Julia terminal, notebook, whichever system of Julia, whichever way you use Julia, you can just type it straight in and uh, you don't need anything extra. Okay, then once you've done that, what type is code? Note that that is just a normal Julia variable, but it has a particular type. And then we can use this dump function to see what there is inside this object. And then use Julia in the usual way to see how you can get out pieces of that object. And then look at how this operation i squared is actually represented. What kind of object is that piece of the expression? And um, copy that into a new variable, code 2, and change it to change the 2 to a 3. Make sure that you don't modify the original code variable. And then copy the new one to code 3 and replace i with i plus 1. Uh, OK, I thought I had. Um, Try, try to do this, yeah. And then define a variable i with a value of four and evaluate the different code expressions using the eval function and check the value of the variable j. Okay, so go ahead and do that. So I'll give you, I uh, no, five minutes or something.
Okay, let's carry on. So, uh, yeah, before, uh, so let me first answer, let's, let's first do this, um, do this, and then, and then I'll answer um, the question about decorators. Because thanks, people, uh, for answering the question uh, on the YouTube chat and on Pigeonhole. Okay. So, let's do what I said. So, we're going to use meta.parse. So, meta.parse, and I'm passing it a string, I, j equals i squared. And what I get back is a Julia expression. This represents the Julia piece of code, j equals i squared. So, I'm going to call that code. And then what we're going to do is, what does it say? What type is it? So type of code, it is of type express, express. So this is the type that represents all Julia expressions. And um, okay, so then I need to dump it, I think. Yes. So dump, you probably know, allows you to see inside any expression. So you see that this is of type expression and it has two things inside, a head and some args. So let's look at those. Code.head, this is equals. That means, you know, it's something equals something. It's an, assi an assignment. That's telling me, that's what tells me that this piece of code represents an, an assignment. It's what is contained in this code.head. And then code.args is a vector that contains the arguments of the other pieces of this thing. And so what this means is that J is the left-hand side of the assignment in this case, and I squared is the right hand side. Okay, so now uh, we're supposed to copy that into a new variable code two. Uh, how is the operation I squared represented? Uh, so we can actually look at that as well. Code dot args number two uh, is actually represented as a call, a function call of the function hat with the I and the two. So, you know, um, yeah. Okay. so. You can see that we had to go inside this object to look at that, that subclass. Okay, and then uh, we're going to, to copy it into code two. So we can do copy code, and hopefully that will work. And then um, we can modify something in code two. So we're supposed to modify it such that uh, replace the power two with a three. Okay, that's more difficult than I was expecting it to be. Um, let's. Let's do something easier to start with. Let's modify the J to be a K. So I can do code two uh, dot args. That was this vector. So an args is just a vector. So I can just use normal Julia to access that vector. So the first component of the vector is you know square brackets one. That's this J. And now if we're lucky, what we can do is actually assign into that object. So we're going to call that colon K. Actually modifying the code two object, and you see that the code two expression has now completely changed. And um, whereas code is still the same as it was before. Okay, so um, so I'll, so how do you modify the, I, the, the the power two? You have to actually go into code dot args number two is that, and then that you know let's call that something. Um, let's call that um, uh, piece. And then what I want to do is actually look inside piece. So uh, remember that you can always use tab. So piece.tab will give me a list uh, of what's inside this object. So it also has a head. That head is this call. And then it has these args. And there, there are the args. And so if I actually mod it, so the, 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 the two is the arg number three. The arg, args means arguments, right? Uh, args three is two, and so now I can actually modify that. So that I'm changing it to three, and so now piece did change, and code two also changed. You think, except that it actually didn't, and so I can't actually do it like that. Why? Because when I did, you know, piece equals code dot args two, that actually makes a new copy of that piece of code, if I'm not mistaken. So that is actually a bit surprising to me. Uh, okay, sorry. So it's it's actually more more difficult. You actually have to do it directly on here, I guess. Code two dot args number three was it or two two dot args three. That's the two, and I modified that to three, and then code two did change. Okay, that was uh, okay. 
Yeah, I was slightly worried about that, and indeed, yeah, so you have to be careful, right? And so, you know, it's pretty annoying to modify things inside uh, inside one of these expressions. Okay, so that was the solution to the exercise. Okay, I'll move that so I'll move that later. Okay, so what? Okay, so that is the the basic idea of what's going on with these code objects. Basically, it, if you have passed something, or if you have actually made it yourself, right? Uh, you can actually make one of these code objects yourself. Then that represents a piece of Julia code, and we can ma manipulate it to give a new piece of Julia code, and that is basically what metaprogramming means. Okay, so any more questions? No. Oh, I see it doesn't actually remove the answered questions. That's annoying. Okay, so, so let's look at the details of what's going on here. So what is code? So here's some pieces of code. So what do they consist of? They consist of these words like function, and they consist of pieces of punctuation like parentheses or symbols like plus. So um, what is code built out of? It's basically built out of these words and symbols. And so Julia calls all of these things symbols with a capital S. That's a Julia type. And so when you, uh, okay. So when you type something like plus into the REPL, it evaluates that. So it says what Julia object is bound to or associated with this symbol. And so in this case, the symbol plus corresponds to a function, which is also called plus, uh, which is a, you know, this, this normal addition function, which has a lot of methods. But what if I want to talk about the piece of code, which is just plus? Then I can do that using this colon. So colon plus makes just the unevaluated piece of code plus. Right? So this is really the unevaluated piece of code that's just the letter, the symbol plus. Similarly, you know, if I define uh, s to be colon x colon is making this x into a symbol. I can also do that by typing symbol and passing it a string. That also makes the same object. And that the type of that thing is symbol with a capital S. So these are the atoms, the smallest building blocks of code. This, uh, it's basically, you can think of it as literally a way to, to, to refer to a variable without evaluating it, right? So this is sort of the variable named x in some sense. Okay, or colon hello is the thing called hello, the variable called hello, again, without evaluating it. And so then these symbols are going to be put together into expressions. So an expression is just anything that's more complicated than a single symbol. And so something like x plus y would be the simplest expression, or even plus x or minus x, right? Minus x is already an expression. It consists of two pieces, the minus and the x. And so we can actually talk about the piece of code x plus y again without evaluating it by using a colon. So, um, so colon brackets or parentheses x plus y makes this object that represents the unevaluated piece of code x plus y. Right. So what is? So I'm I'm always going to use ex, uh, which I'll pronounce x often. But ex is means expression. Right. It's just a variable name that I'm defining, I'm assigning to that variable name, the result of this kind of calculation or computation, which is the expression. So this, again, this colon parenthesis is sort of one thing that means, or together with this other parenthesis over here, which means make whatever is in between the parentheses into a Julia expression object and do not evaluate it. So we get this unevaluated piece of code x plus y. Okay. So, um, of course, if we type x plus y into the REPL without doing this, then it will give us an error because in this notebook, I don't have a variable called x that is defined yet. And so that will give us an error until I define a variable x, until I bind x to an, uh, an object. Okay, so, so now we have this ex object. What is its type? It's this type expra that we just saw with a capital E. So expra is a type that represents any Julia expression, as I said, and it's more complicated than a symbol. So how is this represented? Again, we're going to use dump. So dump of ex 
gives you this 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 view of what's inside this object. So its head is as a symbol call, right? So as again, we can use x dot tab and look at x dot head, and it is call. That means that this expression represents a function call. Which function is being called? Well, the, the one that corresponds to this first argument. What are the arguments of that function? They're the ones corresponding to these second arguments. So you see that this is why I said that x plus y is the same as plus of x comma y. So you see that actually Julia normalizes these two. It reduces these both of these expressions to exactly the same form. And it writes out, it prints out, it displays that form as x plus y with the infix notation. That's just for human consumption. Actually, you see the internal representation is closer to plus of x plus parentheses x, y. Or even, you know, eh, this at some point in the past, eh, you know, sort of used to be represented as something like call of plus x, y. And that's basically what the internal representation still looks like. So we can think of this as sort of core plus x, y, which is not Julia simplex anymore. But intuitively, that's what's happening, right? And actually, there's this other um, Other way of looking at these um, these objects, which is this so-called S expression, that's a concept from Lisp, and uh, this is just a different way of viewing it, of, of visualizing it. So this is, you know, a tuple, and all of the things are just listed inside the tuple. Okay. So this is just what I was just saying. Now uh, you may have noticed that args is actually an array of type any. It's actually a basically a vector. Uh, of type uh, with, with element type any. And why is that? Well, if you think about x plus 1, for example, the piece of code x plus 1, and you dump that, what you see is that you get um, this integer 1, actually, inside this call. right? And so uh, you have two symbols and an integer. That means that the vector should be of type any so that it can contain all these different types of objects. So that's why. Uh, args, you know, type of x dot args is a vector of any. So I should have mentioned that, of course, I am using Julia 1.6. Uh, on Julia, previous versions of Julia, you would not have seen this vector of any. You would have seen array anyone. But there's no reason to be using any previous version of Julia. Everybody should switch to using the new version. OK. Before I go on, I should just uh, forgot to say what is a decorator. So apparently, a decorator in Python is more like a higher order function, which takes in a function and returns a modified function. And so that actually could not do this at time that is uh, being done by Julia. So in I in Jupyter with Python, in a, Py, a Jupyter Python notebook, you can actually use these percent operators, and they do something special. They can actually have access exactly to the syntax uh, tree. They, they don't take in a function, they take in really the syntax. And so then they can do these kind of timing things. And that's the equivalent, uh, that would be the closest equivalent of Julia's macros. But they're, you know, they're very, these very special things that, that are not really in Python itself. They're in this sort of uh, notebook language or whatever. Yeah, so thanks. Um, thanks for the, the uh, clarification that a decorator is just a higher order function, which is not good enough to do what macros do, which is rewrite code. Okay. So yeah, so we can also, you know, expert is just a Julia object. So we can just call the constructor of expert. And the way that works is you just give all of these pieces to straight to expert and it will construct this expression just the way that we have been using it. Okay. So now let's get into more complicated expressions. So any questions about that? Um, Is the output of dump an AST? Thanks. I was going to. I was going to say at some point. I thought. Think I wrote something about that. So what does dump do? Dump of x. It 
outputs this information. But actually, if I do result equals that, and then I ask, what is the value of result? You'll see that there's nothing there. So um, result is actually nothing. So what dump is doing is just displaying, basically is using a print, print statements to display the structure, but it does not return the structure. The structure is just, um, you know, to access the structure, um, you need to to do what I was doing and sort of go inside and look at each piece in turn. So x dot head is this, and then x dot args is this. Because what what how would you actually return this uh, object? You could so so an, what is an AST? It's an abstract syntax tree. So we're about to see see that in more detail, but um, there is you know the the extra type is the abstract syntax tree actually, uh, and so that is already present. You don't. What could dump do that? That would. Um, what could dump return? It, it's not very clear, and so it doesn't return anything at all. Okay, thanks. Good question. Uh, there are new questions. Are there other possible heads of expressions other than equal and call? Very good question. The answer is yes. We'll see some of them later. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a list anywhere of exactly what all the possible heads are. Um, can I th immediately think of anything else that can be a head? Uh, so, well, let, let's yeah. So here's another example. So the way you, 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 you the way you check how Julia represents something, a piece of syntax as a piece of code, is with meta.parse. And so, for example, what about this? How would Julia represent indexing into X with a number one? Uh, so let's call that x2 and dump x2. What we see is, oh, this is a different head, right? This is a head called ref for reference. So this is like re reference or dereference the object x at position one. Okay. So yeah, there are all kinds of heads. And so often what you will see in code that analyzes these things is just checking all kinds of different heads. Oh, yeah. So another one. For example, x3 is the tuple one, two, three. Let's pause that. By the way, in my uh, variant of English, which is UK, Southern English, uh, Southern England, English from Southern England, I say pause with a Z, Z sound. Whereas in, in American English, apparently people say pass with an S sound. Uh, it's a funny, funny distinction. Okay, so uh, let's dump that we see that the head is now a symbol tuple. So yeah, there are plenty of other kinds of heads. All the different pieces, you know, all the different kinds of things that you can have in Julia um, have different heads, actually. Let's look at uh, x4, which is just, just a, a vector, even. And two, what does that look like? Uh, what is the head of that, x4.head? That is actually vect. Right, so there's all kinds of different um, things. Uh, x5 equals method of pars one less than e uh, x less than equal to y. Uh, what is x5 dot head? It, oh, it's a call again. Okay, but if I do less than or equal to z, so I now have this chain of things, then I get a different head, which is a comparison, etc. Right, so. Yeah, there are plenty of different heads, and the, that's part of the difficulty of metaprogramming. You, you suddenly become responsible for doing all of this hard work that Julia was doing, which is parsing and understanding what the structure of the expression is. When you're doing metaprogramming, you become responsible for doing that. Why did I expect code two to change when I changed the argument of piece since piece is a copy of code? Yeah, so I didn't realize that it was going to be a copy of code. I thought it would be a reference to that piece but actually, it's a copy, and that's why um, that's why it changed. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the questions. Let's carry on. Okay. So, 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 you know, so now the key question that we've already kind of seen is how does how is this expression represented? X plus Y times Z. Right. That's a more complicated expression. So far, we've basically only been dealing with expressions with one single operator. Now we have two operators. So the first thing that we have to know is, well, there are two possible ways of interpreting this, which are, are these. 
x plus y times z or x plus y times z right so basically this is the question of operator precedence and precedence as in um you know which precedes which which is more important so if you frequent twitter you'll see endless completely pointless ridiculous waste of time discussions about you know these rules that people learn in basic like elementary school or something that this operator is more important than this one and so then you can write down these expressions that are completely ambiguous like what is you know eight divided by eight divided by eight or something i don't even remember what the examples are you know what does this second divide mean is that eight divided by eight divided by eight or you know what is two to the power two to the power two which which power do you take first they're all completely ridiculous um but you know some decision has to be made so the decision that julia makes is that that it it assigns some precedence to these operators so Julia actually, in this particular case, interprets the times as being stronger. And so it does the times first, the multiplication first, and then the addition. Why? Because somebody decided that that's how it should be. If you want to change that, you need to actually put parentheses in. And that precedence uh, of operators is actually hard-coded. You cannot change it, at least at the moment. And uh, it's hard-coded in the scheme, which is what the parser, the Julia parser is written in, in some file. It has a list of which operators have which precedence. And I think there's some way that you can see that from within Julia, I don't remember. Anyway, that's the situation. And so, um, you know, uh, you can actually see that. So we can do, uh, can we? Oh, yeah, you can see that, yeah. You can see that by looking at the structure of this expression, actually, that will immediately tell you, right? So it's writing it out like this without, with no parentheses, but actually it already made, Julia already made a choice of which one is higher precedence. So how does Julia actually represent this, this expression? So I want you to think about that for a minute and maybe play around with it and um, come to a conclusion. So I'll be back in, let's take a, a little break, uh, maybe five minute break while you think about this and then we'll move on to the next notebook. So I'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, let's carry on. So how is x plus y plus y, y times z represented? Let's move on to the next notebook to find out. I mean, you already kind of know, it's an expression tree. <clears throat> so as usual, we can use dump to see the structure. And as soon as we do, we see that it gets kind of complicated. Why? Because there's something interesting going on, which is that now there are three arguments to this call. Oh, there are always three arguments, yeah. So what we see is that the call, the outside call is a plus, as I said, the times uh, has higher precedence. So it's doing plus of x with something. And that something is what? Well, it's y times z. So this whole thing, this, this third um, argument is y times z, right? So x dot args is uh, this vector. OK, sorry, I need to evaluate this. Yeah, so x dot args three, the third argument is this sub expression. And indeed, the type of that thing is expression. So this is another expression that is embedded inside the first expression. In other words, the expr type is a recursive data type. It can contain objects of the same type. <clears throat> And this is the way that, that Julia and, and I, I guess most or all languages solve this problem of, well, I can actually have an arbitrarily complicated syntax tree or also called computational graph. And um, which, uh, you know, uh, I can have an arbitrarily complicated expression. How do I represent that? I represent that as this kind of recursive tree structure. So I can actually see the tree structure uh, Yes, we've already seen the example of an assignment that also has the same thing. So an assignment has a different head, the equals, and it's saying x is equal to this other thing, and that other thing is again an expression. So it has this hierarchical or nested structure, which I can see using this tree view package that I wrote. There are various ways to see these structures. For example, there's this graph recipes.jl library, but I wrote this one, I think, uh, a few years ago when None of, none, none of these other things existed, maybe. And this uses the great ticks graphs package, which uses the ticks, LaTeX, T-I-K-Z. Uses T-I-K-Z with some capitalization that I don't remember, uh, graphs package. T-I-K-Z is a LaTeX library for drawing figures. And um, so you get this nice tree structure. So what this is telling me that, yeah, I have plus of x with something, and that something is has the same structure. It's times of y and z. So it's another expr. So as I said, expr is representing the whole of this syntax tree, also called AST, abstract syntax tree. OK. Yeah, so uh, here's another example. Um, so I haven't mentioned this yet, a different way Another way, instead of just colon parenthesis, uh, you can, uh, if you have a, a, a large section of code, you often use quote end instead to surround that, these, these several statements here. And this is what um, the result looks like. Now that's yet another different type of head actually, right? So here's my X, uh, my expression. What is the head of that expression? It's actually block, right? So Block just means a sequence of code statements, one after the other. Here's two code statements. And so when I view it as a tree, I get this, this again, this tree structure uh, with a block just pointing then to each of these uh, statements. Let's, let's do another one, z equals z plus x. And then um, we we'll get a more complicated tree. Now the block just points to three children, and each of those has this same structure. Okay. Yeah, so that's just a useful visualization tool to, to, to help you see the structure of your expressions in a more visual way. I'm a very visual person, so I think this is a very important uh, tool to have. OK, but now we actually want to get into the nitty gritty of how to move through expression trees and do something to them. So ex since complex expressions do have this recursive structure, we need to, of course, take that into account when we manipulate them. And so we're going to use the simplest possible example, which is given an expression, suppose that it has some x's in it. 
I want to just replace each x by a y. And so, of course, the easiest way to do this is to take this expression object and move through it and modify the expression so that each x gets replaced by a y. OK, so how will we do this? Well, clearly, we need to check whether each argument is equal to the symbol x with the colon, colon x, the symbol x. If so, then we were going to replace it. If not, we'll move on. OK, so please write that function. So write a function substitute, bang. Remember that in Julia, it's a convention that functions that modify their argument end with a bang or exclamation mark. So that should take in an expression, ex, and replace each, co each symbol x with a symbol y. And then test it on the expression x plus x plus y, x plus x times y. Does it work correctly? If not, what are you actually missing? So don't worry if you're missing this thing. We're about to see how to, how to, to solve that. And then I just left a few blank lines so that you can't see the result, right? The answer is just below. Please don't look at it until you actually try this. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to try writing this function. And I'll look to see if there are any more questions. OK, so I'm going to um, live code the answer, even though the answer is downstairs. So we're going to write a function, substitute. Bang. It's going to take in an expression, ex. So as usual in Julia, when we don't need to tell it what type arguments are, we don't. I could label it to, to, to take in things of type extra, but that might have disadvantages. So um, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to assume that ex is an expression, and we're going to look at its arguments and replace them uh, if they're equal to x. So basically, I'm going to, going, to, going to need to loop over the arguments in the expression. So for i in one to length of the argument of the expression, I'm going to check is, you know, um, is the ith argument equal to the symbol x? If so, then I'm going to assign it to the symbol y. So you know, we have to be careful between checking equality with double equals and assignment with single equals. Uh, and then I'm just going to end. And then I'm going to replace uh, that, that. That's all I need to do. And then I can, you know, if I want, I could return the expression. But it, since it's modifying the expression, that's not strictly necessary. But anyway, let's do that. OK, so now we're going to do x equals the expression. So I have to, I want an expression. I have to, uh, of course, use the colon. If you don't use the colon, it will try to evaluate this, and it will give you an error. And then I want to substitute into this, hello, into this expression. And we see that, oh, great. You know, this x, first x, got changed to a y. But, of course, the second did not get changed to a y. Because we only looked at the arguments of, um, 
the, the expression. And the second argument, or the third argument, is this complex co uh, you know, compound expression, uh, which is not equal to x, even though it contains an x. And so that is what's missing. We need to deal with the case where that x is hidden inside, recursively inside the structure. So what is the correct way to do that? Well, let's write a new version of the function. Um, let's just hide that old other thing. So what do we need to do? So the i argument might be equal to x, but it also might be an expression itself. So that's another case that I need to check. So else, if args, the, the i element, or the i argument, sorry, um, Yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, if the i argument is an expression, right, so how do I write that in Julia? I actually use the is a operator. There's an is a operator, right, S A, which, which works like this. If that is an expression, which in English doesn't quite sound right because it should be is an expression, but anyway, so that's the same as, you know, if, uh, so that's the same as if the type of x dot args i is equal to, uh, I guess, triple equal maybe, equal to expression. And so that's a bit of a you know, mouthful to write. So instead of writing that, we, we just write is an expression. If it is an expression, then I need to substitute inside that expression. I need to call substitute on that inside expression. And if I do that, hopefully, um, sorry about the Typing too fast out of the wrong angle uh, is a bad idea. Okay. And then I actually did manage to substitute all of the x's inside the expression. So this is the key part. So this is a recursive call. What is a recursive call? It's calling the same function again inside the function itself. So the substitute function calls the substitute function on a smaller piece of argument, a smaller piece of the structure. And of course, recursive fu functions are dangerous because they could just go on and on forever. But in this case, it's sort of intuitively clear that it has to stop at some point. And it stops at the point when I've got all the way down the tree and it's no longer, I no longer have expressions. I just have atoms, you know, which are either symbols or it could be numbers as well. So of course, we, we now have this pretty complicated function and we should go and do some testing to see if it actually works. So. Um, what does substitute, or let's, let's say x is x plus one. Does the substitute work on that particular expression? It does. What about x is just the symbol x? Does substitute work on that expression? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Because I forgot that that was a possible case. There's a possible case where, uh, uh, where, where the expression isn't actually a Julia extra object. It's just a symbol in this case. And so I should go and actually deal with that case. So exercise, go and fix it to deal with that case. So exercise, deal with the case of just the symbol. OK, great. So hopefully that is, uh, you know, I think that's really the simplest example where you can see exactly what's going on. You need to scan through all of these arguments, check what's going on with each one of them, but you have to deal with a recursive case where in th there might be an expression there that you need to recurse into. Uh, and so I think this is really the simplest example that sort of highlights that. Okay, so there are some more questions. Uh, I, I think now's a good time to, to, to deal with those. Um, yeah, oh no, before I do that, yeah. So this version that we just wrote is a mutating function it actually modifies the original expression, which is annoying, right? Because I want to actually, I want to actually see the original expression and then see what I replaced it with to see if to, to check if it actually worked or not, you know, visually. So of course we should be writing actual unit tests for this software that we've just developed now. And that's very important when you're using mesh programming to always have excellent unit tests to cover all these cases because it's so easy to to do something wrong and and, and mess something up if you modify the code. Okay, so of course it's easier to use mutation for this stuff. Why? Because it's actually difficult to, you know, 
as you go along down this structure and you're recursing into it, you have to build up an equivalent structure on the other side. That's how you would have to do it if you were not using mutation. So you know, that should be possible, but it's actually tricky to do. So the easier solution is just to literally make a whole copy of the tree and then mutate that copy. And so here's a, a function called substitute without the bang where I do that. So the first thing I do is make a copy of the AST and then sub do the substitution on the new AST and ret return that new object. So that's a, a good little pattern to use. There was a question about copy versus deep copy. Why did I use copy? Why did that work? Copy, uh, deep copy is usually necessary when you have these recursive arrays inside your AST. And so I don't actually know why copy works. You should probably always use deep copy. To be honest, I'm not quite sure about that point, but I think if you use deep copy, uh, that should be fine. Okay, there's some more, <coughs> excuse me, more questions. Uh, is there a trick to converting things to Unicode after using the backslash? I don't know, maybe your editor is, or something is not configured right. If you do it in the REPL, it should work. The, there's just the standard Julia REPL. Um, uh, in the notebook, it should work. Uh, I don't know, I can't answer that question, unfortunately, right now. Uh, you should ask on like the Julia Slack or something uh, to see if people can help you with that. Okay, and there was another question about at tree. This at tree that I used from this package uh, should give you this nice LaTeX diagram. So in order for that to work, you actually need to install LaTeX and PDF to SVG, or no, SVG to PDF. There are instructions on the tree view documentation uh, for that, but you will need a LaTeX installation. That's the downside of this package. If you don't have LaTeX installed on your machine, you won't get this nice view, and, but you can use graphrecipes.jl instead to get something similar. How do you implement operator precedence? Uh, I don't know what that, quite what that means. Uh, yeah, you just use parentheses to, 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 to uh, force whatever uh, you, know, you want to happen. So um, let's look at that. So, uh, you know, so um, if I want, uh, you know, to do addition first, I just use parentheses. Right? So x plus y times z. I actually put extra parentheses myself, and then Julia will realize, oh, you want x plus y evaluated first. Okay. Can I clarify equals equals versus triple equals? I'm uh, not going to get into that uh, right now. Basically, triple equals tests equality of of um, of objects, whereas double equals tests equality of concepts. So, one equals one point zero is true uh, because they are equal as mathematical objects. One triple equals one point zero is false because they are not equal as bit patterns. What is the greatest use of metaprogramming that you have ever seen? Well, that's a great question. Um, I don't necessarily want to pick out a particular package. Uh, you know, uh, some some great packages that I can mention that use metaprogramming extensively are Jump for specifying optimization problems. Various packages in the differential equations ecosystem, like Catalyst. Uh, I have a package called Interval Constraint Programming that takes an expression and turns it into a function that can test whether a box is inside or outside a set. Uh, it's a great question. It's hard to answer that. OK. Uh, OK, I think that's all the questions, except there's a tricky one about why does copy work. Uh, is it correct to say that this suggests that metaprogramming can change string replacement to syntax tree element assignment? The purpose is to keep the syntax unchanged. I'm not quite sure what that means. Metaprogramming's purpose is to take a an expression and modify it in some way. That's That's the point of metaprogramming. I'm trying to compose macros. I have at bar at foo function uh, func. Uh, can I explicitly apply foo before bar is applied? Yes, I think you can just put parentheses around uh, around that. Can yeah, let's come back to that when I do macros. Is okay. Yeah, I think that's all the questions. Let's carry on. So. Um, of course, you can make the substitute function more general by specifying what you want to substitute with what. I won't do that right now. It's just basically the same. But this exercise is more interesting. Find which variables are used inside a given expression. So here, the expression 2x plus y times x minus 1 should return, well, which variables are used. 
I have x, then y, then x. So of course I want to return just x comma y, say as a vector. Um, yeah, so try and do this exercise. I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, and of course the hint is that this requires that you return a vector of variables from your, you know, when you calculate stuff, you need to return a vector of variables. Okay, so just give a, a, have a, have a go at this question for a few minutes. Okay, so while, while you finish doing that, I'll just remark that thanks to people in the YouTube comments, uh, I have learned that TIX is spelled T, capital T, small i, small k, capital Z, and it's a German, an acronym in German, which uh, is TIX is kein Zeichenprogramm. Uh, so that means TIX is not a drawing program. It's one of these recursive acronyms that um, computer scientists love to invent. And uh, yeah, thanks. Recursive acronym, actually very appropriate for this workshop. And uh, yeah, as somebody said, operator precedence, I think I already said, is defined in the Julia Parza in scheme. You, you can't actually modify it. Uh, but if you want your own operator precedence, you can do that with one of these non-standard string letter rules, but you are going to have to re-implement the whole parsing business. And, and one other comment about strings versus um, Julia uh, syntax trees, you know, if you do x plus y with sort of lots of white space, then it will actually just remove all the white space for you and realize which white space is important and which white space is not important. If you do a string, uh, you know, x plus with lots of white space y, you actually have to deal with the white space nonsense yourself, and that's a big pain. Yeah, thanks, that's a good point. Okay, so let's answer this question. So how am I going to get these variables out of my expression? So let's say I have a function called um, variable get, what, what's it called? Get ver find variables, whatever. It's going to take in an expression. And so um, what's the first thing that I have to do? Well, I have to look through the arguments and see if any of them are symbols. So again, for i in one to length args. So you might think that I could do for arg, in length arg. Oh well, in this in this case, I actually could for for arg in args. So that the, in the previous case, I could not do this as for arg in args. I had to actually loop through with a counter because I had to modify one of the arguments. In this case, I'm not modifying anything. So now I can actually um, okay because not modified. Um, so I'm going to just loop with this nice Julia 
for arg and arg syntax. Okay, so for each argument, uh, sorry, x dot args, ex dot args, the arguments of my expression, for each one, what do I need to do? I have to uh, check which arguments are in there. So if arg is a symbol, then I'm just going to return a vector containing that symbol. Uh, else, if arg is an expression, I'm going to return find variables of that expression. No, this is, this is a bit complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to return it. I need to I need to accumulate all of the results, right? So let's make a, a vector called all, uh, or all results, or all variables. And I'm going to push the result onto this all variables uh, vector. Right? And actually, I need to do that here as well. So I'm going to push onto all variables the result arc. Should work, and then I'm going to return all variables. So let's try that. So find variables of x plus x times y, and I get plus x and times x y. So that's clearly not at all what I wanted. So um, why is that? <clears throat> so basically, it's because you know, plus is the operator of this call, and I want to ignore that. And so actually, I don't want for arg in x dot args. I just want x dot args from 2 to n. So when I do that, then I get something more reasonable. I get x and then x, y. And so of course, what I need to do is somehow collapse all of those vectors now down to something. So I can do that with, for example, vcat of all variables dot, dot, dot. And when I do that now, I get it all collapsed down to something. And now I'm going to do unique of that and sort that. And then, then I get the correct answer. So um, that's one way you could do it. Of course, that doesn't quite work, right? So find variables, again, if I just pass in a symbol, again, have to fix that, that case. That's a bit annoying. Um, what about like x plus y? That works. But then, for example, it turns out that z equals x plus y doesn't work because I'm actually ignoring this uh, this first argument now, because I just assumed that the head was a call. Right? So actually what I have to do is go inside and check if is the head a call. If the head is a call, then do this. If the head is an equals, then do this. So it actually becomes pretty annoying. And I'm not going to do it right now because it's, it's um, just just busy work. You can but you know exercise, fix up all of these annoying cases. Now, if you look at this code, though, one in, one important pattern to point out, or anti-pattern in this case, is this is a business, right? So whenever you see if something is a something in Julia, you're testing the type of the object in Julia. Whenever you see that, it's a terribly bad idea. Oh, somebody said we can directly use a set. That's a great idea. Yes, thanks. You could just directly use a set. That's a very good idea. Um, uh, yeah, so let's just do that set of that. But then you still need to do the sort of unique at the end, right? Uh, not, you don't need the unique in the end, a, a, any anymore. You need sort of collect now uh, when it's a set. So that's pretty annoying. Oh, and that didn't work. Why didn't that work? I'm not, I don't want VCAT anymore. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, um, there's something. Oh, yeah, you don't have an is less of symbol and a vector. OK, so that's actually not going to work right now. You can make it work, but it's you have to work harder than, I, than what I want to do right now. OK. Um, set is not already sorted, no. Append instead of push, sure. Yeah, there are all kinds of you know better. Yeah, I should have used append. You're right. Yeah, there are all kinds of better solutions. Yeah, I agree. That's not really the point, right? The, the, <laughs> I mean, I'm not claiming that I'm writing good code. This is we're trying to explore, you know, how basically what I'm trying to show is what my 
thought process would be. And then, then uh, later on, I'm going to polish it up, you know, to, to get better code. So, but what I what I do want to point out is that this is a is an anti-pattern in Julia. What is an anti-pattern is something that is sort of frowned upon or disrecommended, or people don't like, or there's a better way of doing it. So, what is the better way of doing it? Um, so, I'm, this is the previous version that I had. Is a number, is a symbol, and else uh, we have an expression, and you you do a different solution. Basically, what we're going to do is instead of doing those is a that is a a great example where we should be using dispatch in Julia. So dispatch, remember, is just we write several different methods or versions of this function, and they use different argument. We, we call them on when the argument is different of different types. So when we have a number, well, there are no, you know, so basically we're, go, we're zooming down this tree, recursing into the tree, and um, when we hit a leaf node that is not an expression, it's either a number or a symbol, say. And probably there are other things that can be too. Uh, so when it's a number, there are no variables. So we return an empty list, an empty vector. When it's a symbol, we just return the vector of that symbol. And then when it's an expression, we do this list array comprehension, sorry, no lists in, in Julia, array comprehension, find variables of arg for arg in x dot args. And um, so that is enough uh, to do this recursion and to bottom out to, to have this recursive base case when you hit a leaf node. So that is the way I would actually prefer to write this in Julia. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and then if you use a set, then a pen doesn't work anymore. It should be union. Yeah, there are all kinds of uh, useful comments in the chat. Thanks. Let me check pigeonhole. New questions. What is the greatest use of... I've already dealt with those questions. Okay, yeah, so I already mentioned quote blocks and remove line numbers. And here, here are some further exercises that I'm going to leave, I think, for now, because we don't have that much time. So given an expression, wrap all the little literal values in the expression with a wrapper type. So uh, let me just show you an example of that. So I'm going to use the interval arithmetic package that I wrote together with my colleague, Ruth Bennett. And um, what does this do? So suppose that I have something like 0 0.1 plus sine of 0 0.2. X is that, right? That is a number. That gives me a number. And the question is, well, this is using floating point arithmetic. How do I actually know whether this is the correct answer? And the answer is, well, actually, it's not the correct answer. It's almost the correct answer. So I could do this with, you know, big, uh, we've already seen this big uh, string literal, uh, non standard string literal. And now I get. A very precise, a very accurate, you know, very an answer with lots of digits. Uh, but I still don't know how many of those digits are actually correct. So probably almost, almost all of them are. But you know, if you do a sort of more complicated, uh, more complicated calculation, you might actually end up with something like catastrophic cancellation, and you don't actually know how many digits are correct. So interval arithmetic is one way to solve this problem. So what we're going to do is use a macro at interval. And we're just going to write out this same expression again, 0 0.1 plus sine of 0 0.2. And what in this at interval macro is doing, it has to be a macro again, is that it will go inside and wrap each of these numbers with an interval. And so it will, con right? So if I just do at interval 0 0.1, what it does is it gives me an interval that contains the true real number 0 0.1 or 1 tenth, 1 divided by 10. So here you can see that uh, the interval is, is something like 0 0.09999, which is just below 0.1, to 0 0.1001, which is just above 0.1. So it's actually wrapping this number in this interval. And it's doing that each time for each of these literals. And then it's calling sine on that, uh, which is guaranteed to contain sine of all numbers in that interval that it wrapped around 0 0.2. And then, so basically for each, Operation is using interval arithmetic operations that guarantee that the result is correct. And so what I get out is an interval that is guaranteed to contain uh, the result of evaluating this expression. So what does this magic at interval actually do? Well, we know how to find that out, right? We just do at macro expand. And it tells me what it does. Okay, it looks a bit annoying, but um, 
basically what it does is it says interval and of and it's using this thing called atomic which is what gives me this minimal interval that is just big enough to contain this uh, real number 0 0.1. So if I do sort of interval arithmetic dot atomic of 0 0.1, that's what actually gives me this, min uh, sorry, float interval float 64. It gives me this minimal interval that wraps around it. And so you can see that what, what it's doing is actually wrapping this, uh, okay, it's a bit more complicated than it actually needs to be now, but it's basically, basically what I'm trying to do sort of morally is, is something like interval let's call it uh, make interval of 0 0.1 plus sign of make interval of 0 0.2. I think it's even implemented basically like this in the code. And so um, that is what, what I want you to be able to do with this macro. So you can go in and wrap every, uh, every, every thing that's not a, you know, everything that's not a function call, you wrap inside something like make interval. So that's, uh, that's a nice exercise. And then here's another exercise. Uh, so plus, minus, et cetera, on floating point numbers can overflow. And in base, there's actually these base.checked add, et cetera, functions that will check uh, if you have overflow. So base.checked multiply. I don't have tab completion. It's annoying. I don't remember what exactly it's called. Base.checked multiply, mol, base.checked mol. Base.checked mol of 1e. 308 with 1e10, that's going to give an overflow error. No. Um, maybe close it before. No. Yeah, I didn't actually check how this works. Uh, I thought it was like this. And of course, there's no documentation. Now there is. No, it actually worked. Strange. I don't know why that's not working. Uh, 1.0. No, I'm not sure what's going on there. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, so you might want to have a piece of code and replace each operation by one of these checked operations, which are supposed to throw an error when you get floating point overflow. So that's another good example of meta programming. Okay, but we should move on to macros, which is a key topic in meta programming and sort of where, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky subject. So, Macros, as we've seen, begin with at. And the point is that a macro will take in a piece of code, replace it with a piece of code, and then compile that new piece of code. So let's define the simplest possible macro. So it's like defining a function in, in terms of the syntax, except that we will replace the function, the word function, with the word macro. So we'll call it macro simple. It receives an expression. And what we're just going to do is display the expression, display the type of the expression, and then, oh, let's do those the other way around, maybe, and then return nothing. The mode. So let's run that on, uh, on some code. Uh, so at simple, you know, A. Uh, so what does it do? It receives this thing that I wrote there. It receives that as its argument, right? So it's receiving something. And you can see that in this case, it, what it's receiving is actually a symbol. It's not an expression, it's a symbol. And that's important to know. You know the same problem that we had just uh, in the previous notebook. That there are these two possible cases, actually. For example, if you pass in a number, it can even be in, an in 64. So that's very important to, to bear in mind when you're writing your own macros. As I said, you know, uh, there are all these cases and suddenly you're the one that has to deal with all these cases that Julia usually takes account of for you. Okay. But if I do something more complicated like x plus y, then I see that indeed I do get an expression. And the expression is this expression object that we've just been dealing with, right? So why did we just spend all this time dealing with expression trees and expression objects? Because that's what a macro is usually going to give you, right? So what is the job of a macro is actually to capture this code that you wrote as a string and the macro parses that string gives you you know into a piece of julia code and then gives you the opportunity to in that moment to manipulate the julia code before it gets compiled and as i said so if you if you then manipulate it and return a new piece of julia code it will actually evaluate that code right so but let's write another one at simple two, which just returns the same expression. 
it's a macro it has to return an expression or like a piece of Julia code. So if I do add simple two of x plus y, what will it do? It gives me an error that x is not defined. Why? Because it is trying to evaluate this piece of Julia code, right? or rather the piece of Julia code that the macro returned, which is happens to be the same one. But but this is this is where we now have an opportunity to actually modify this code before it gets compiled and evaluated. So maybe I should avoid the word evaluated because there's this function called eval that we'll look at later that evaluates code. Okay. So, okay. So how do, should we structure a macro? If we want to write a macro or, you know, uh, some people were, uh, were saying on the Julia Slack, uh, when I asked what they wanted to see in this workshop, they said, how, you know, I want to know if there's a package that uses a lot of macros, how do I actually get my head around what the macro is doing? So, um, yeah, that's a very good and difficult question. So by the, so I've already shown you that, you know, at edit, you can immediately jump to the definition of the macro. At macro expand shows you what the macro is actually doing and, and you'll just have to play around with it and try and sort of maybe comment out bits of the macro or, you know, copy the macro definition into a notebook and comment out bits so you can see what it's doing. But the, the main message is that the way you should structure macros is as follows. The only thing a macro should do, in my opinion and many people's opinions, is act as this interface between the, the Julia sort of parser uh, and the Julia compiler in the sense that it receives the piece of code and then it immediately sends that piece of code to a function. Right, so this is going to be a function which I called underscore. So, so we're going to write a macro that replaces a plus with a times. And um, we're going to call it add to multiply. It's going to receive a piece of code and it's going to immediately pass that piece of code to a function that I called underscore add to multiply. I could have called that add to multiply with no underscore, but that might just be a bit too confusing because then there's a macro and a function. So I just called it underscore to mean that it's sort of in an internal thing. And um, what does that function do? It takes in an expression and it returns an expression. So it's just like the functions that we were writing uh, just now in the previous notebook. Right? So that's why we were doing that. But this defines the macro. Of course, if I call the macro right now, add to multiply of you know, x plus y, um, it returns an error because I have not yet written this function underscore add to multiply. So let's write that function right now. It's exactly like we were writing in the previous notebook. So we'll just check, you know, um, we'll just check, is the head of the expression equal to call? So is it a function call? And is the first argument of the function call plus? If so, then replace the first argument by a times and then return the expression. Okay, so that defines the add to multiply x. And the point of splitting out the macro into this function is that now I can test, as the developer of the macro, I can now test, is this function doing what I want, right? So underscore add to multiply, of a plus b, it gives me the right thing, so I'm happy. Whereas, you know, add to multiply, it was like a minus b, gives me back a minus b, that's great. So now I can try running add to multiply of a plus b in at add to multiply, right? The macro add to multiply. And of course I get, again, because when I say of course, it's of course, you know, from the point of view of somebody who has thought through this already, um, I hate it when people use of course, so apologies for using of course because Usually, when somebody says, of course, uh, half the audience doesn't see why it's so obvious. Uh, so <clears throat> A is not defined. Why is A not defined? Because there's no variable A. But why, why is Julia asking me, you know, trying to, to work out what's going on with the variable A? Because what the macro does, again, is replaces this piece of code with a new piece of code, which is A times B, and then compiles that new piece of code and sort of runs it, basically. And so it's trying to run the, the new code a times b, and a is not defined. Of course, of course. Now, if I define these variables a and b, and then run the macro, it does the correct thing. Which, what is the correct thing? It looks like it's supposed to calculate a plus b, which would be five, but it's not. It's calculating a times b, which is six, because the macro modified this code. So macros are dangerous, right? Because it looks like it's doing one thing and it's doing something completely different. So, and dangerous, as we know, is the counterpart of powerful. So macros are powerful, but they are also dangerous. So 
that's the, the message. There's a, a, a new question on the pigeonhole. Can a Julia macro have a variable number of arguments? Can the same macro be called with two arguments and three arguments? Great question. There'll be an example of that later. The answer is yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is so okay. So the point is that you know if we just write the macro and then try and run it like this, we'll get we get these weird errors. We get weird results that we don't expect. And so that's why I'm saying that the best way to develop a macro is just split out the actual code into a function so that you can check the, with the function that it's doing the right thing. Of course, you can also use macro expand to to check that it's doing the right thing. And indeed, we see that a plus b is being converted into main.a times main.b. Main is this sort of uh, global namespace that I'm working in, and so it is doing the right thing. Okay. Check the YouTube chat. With great power comes great responsibility, definitely. Uh, thanks for that comment. <clears throat> and oh, we could also interject here, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so uh yes we should definitely be careful of using these tools so macro hygiene this is you know a key and difficult concept what does this mean so the word hygiene you know basically means cleanliness and so this refers to the fact that macros are actually doing some something right you can see that it did something here what did it do it replaced a by main dot a but it actually did something that I didn't tell it to do, apparently. I apparently, you know, I told it, oh, just, you know, take this piece of code and replace this plus with a times, but it did something else. It also replaced A with main.a. And so it's doing something sophisticated, which is it's trying to establish which variables in this macro definition are local variables and which are global variables. And the global variables are replaced with main, whereas the local variables are... Um, uh, are turned, as we saw right at the start of the of the talk, are turned into these kind of um, generated names that are unique. And so that is that is part of this macro hygiene sort of pass, where it takes this code and tries to clean it in a such a in, in the sense that it tries not to step on, not not to sort of do anything to variables that live in your code. So you might have a code you know, called with a variable called A, and then inside the macro, you might be using a, a variable called A, and those should be different variables A. You should, that A should not be manipulating your variable called A. But sometimes you do want to manipulate your variable called A, and so then you need to explicitly tell Julia to do that. So here's an exercise where we'll see exactly how that works. So I want you to define a macro simple two. Let's call it simple three now, since I already had a simple two, whatever. You can call it whatever you want. That returns the expression that was passed to it, as I already did. What happens if you call y equals x squared? Now define define uh, you know, x with the value three. Does the macro work? Does the variable y exist? Right. So you want you might want this to actually make the variable y y y exist in your in your code. And uh, to see what's happening, use macro expand. And then it tells you, you know, a bit lower uh, exactly what to do after that. So uh, I'll give you sort of five minutes to do this exercise. Because this is like a key, this is the key moment when we understand um, macro hygiene and uh, all of that stuff.
Okay, let's 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 do this. So, <clears throat> so let's just define this macro, you know, as we already did with one of the previous ones. That it's just going to return the same expression. Uh, sorry, I'm using ex, not expr. So, uh, yeah. So as it did before, it gives a not defined error. Xx not defined because uh, it's trying to, you know, apparently assign to a new variable yy, but with the value of the variable xx, and xx is not defined yet, right? If I just do xx, it tells me it's not defined. So let's define xx, okay? Now it should work, right? So yy equals xx squared. Indeed, it calculates xx squared, that's great, and it gives me 100, and so now I expect that yy should exist, right? Because if I ex execute the code yy equals xx squared just in the normal way, then I will get a variable yy created. But yy, I run it and it is not defined. Oh dear. That's strange, right? Apparently. So, not apparently, it is strange. So, what's going on? So, let's ask Julia what it's doing. So, add macro expand, uh, this is simple three. And what we see what I was trying to hint at. So, it realized that xx is supposed to refer to main.xx the xx that lives in my world, in my world of code that I'm writing. But it thinks that yy is a local variable, a local variable that exists inside the macro. Right? And so it replaced yy with one of these generated new names. Right? So var here means variable. And this is a string because it has double quotes. So var, var quotes is actually a, one of these non-standard string literals. So this is actually making a variable with this strange name with hashes inside. So this strange name with hashes inside is one of these sort of unique names that you can get from GenSim. GenSim generates a new symbol. Well, that's not even true. Okay, sorry, my mistake. It's not quite that. It's more complicated than that because it does actually record this YY, right? So I'm using, it, it remembers that the name has yy in it, but it makes it a, a sort of unique version of the variable yy by adding this sort of unique identifier in front of it. And so this is a variable that exists inside the macro. Inside the macro, it's making a local variable called yy, uh, whose value is the value that I get when I evaluate xx squared. So it's value 100, but it's not affecting this yy that lives in my world. And that's usually what I want to do, right? Because I might, inside my macro, I might be defining all kinds of variables that I don't want to see outside the macro. And so, yes, those should be hidden away with these weird names. But in this particular case, I want, you know, this macro to make a variable called y1. And so what I want to do is, is I want to, I have to tell Julia that that is the case that I explicitly want it to evaluate yy, this yy in my world. And that's what's called escaping. That's actually making the macro non-hygienic because it's going to touch my thing. It's going to be non-clean. And so we need to escape from this mechanism. Um, and we do that using this word esc, e -S -C, which is the bane, you know, the, the problem for all macro developers and all metaprogramming people. They hate esc with a passion because it's never clear when you should actually use it. Um, and I kind of agree with that. It's, it's, it's difficult to know when to use it and when to not to use it. I don't have any good, um, you know, really, really hints or tips about that, except to say that you need it exactly when this is happening, right? Exactly when you're trying to modify a variable that exists outside. Okay, maybe not exactly when, but that's an example of when. So let's rewrite this macro, now simple four, in the correct way, right? So we're going to escape the whole expression in this case. And then, so what we're doing is escape the whole expression and then interpolate that back into the code. So we haven't really, um, I haven't really talked about interpolation yet. So uh, maybe I should just mention that first. So what is interpolation? So suppose I have an expression, which is, um, uh, you know, one expression, which is, uh, let's just call it the symbol. So S is the symbol X. And now if I write the expression, you know, something plus Y, and I want to say, insert in this point in the expression, 
this symbol or this expression, and let's just make that into an expression. Uh, so let's make that x plus y, sorry. Let's make that x plus y. And then let's make this x2, which is z times. And then I want to insert this whole expression into this place, expression two, I'm going to use dollars, dollars ex, or dollars brackets ex, maybe it's clear. And that, so that just like in string interpolation in Julia, where you put a piece of string inside another string, this is going to put the piece of expression inside this other expression. And I get the expression with this substituted inside. So that's what string inter uh, was what sorry, that's what expression interpolation is. So this dollars every time you, time you see the dollars, it's some kind of um, interpolation. So this is exactly what's happening here, right? So we're um, so let's 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 do x two equals this, and then we're going to return x two. So this is actually interpolating something. What is it interpolating? It's interpolating that. I often personally like to add extra space, extra white space in complicated expressions to show visually what's going on. Uh, some people don't like that. They're wrong. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> x2 is escape of x. I can also do it like this. x3 is escape is x2, right? So I, I don't think I've ever seen people do this, but I actually quite like this um, because I, I'm saying kind of more, you know, it's sort of just visually clearer to say this, this particular thing I want it to escape and just give it a name and then um, it just cleans up visually the code, in my opinion, and then return x3. And when I do that, then it all works. So when I evaluate this now, simple four, and now I have a yy. Now yy exists. And if I do the macro expand of simple four, I see that it does what I expect it to do. Uh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's using the y's and x's that I thought it would use. It's not using, you know, it's giving me a different result from the at macro expand that I had before, where I had this local variable instead on the left hand side. So this is the basic message about macro hygiene that um, you, you need to know, is that I want this expression to escape. And so I uh, wrap it in escape so that so that so that, that that expression is going to stay inside and be evaluated by the in the in the context that I am calling the macro from. Now you could say that uh, if you you know if we go back to this case, it Julia already knew that x should be evaluated in in this external context. It's only y that should be evaluated that, that, that needs this escaping, and so I'm actually escaping sort of too much, and this is you know a common problem actually in more complicated macros. I don't have an example, but it's a more common a common problem in more complicated things where. People just try to escape everything, and then that causes its own problems because some of the things are, you know, being evaluated now in the wrong context again. And so that the message is just: you only want to escape ideally exactly what you need to escape, which is the stuff that needs to be evaluated in the external context that Julia is trying to evaluate in the internal macro world. Okay, so Tom Kwong has a great video about this as well. I strongly recommend that you watch that. Uh, it's linked from the resources. And he has this great book, I think I mentioned, um, which goes into a lot of detail about um, nice uh, patterns for metaprogramming. Okay. Okay, so. There's, um, let's let's do this exercise. Hopefully this is going to work. Defining at my show macro that reproduces the behavior of show. So let's rem remember what show does. So if I have a variable y, which is equal to three, then at show y, print out y equals three. So I'm gonna use print, a print line uh, for this, but I need to have the, the, the variable name in here and the variable value as well. So, um, Let's take a couple of minutes to try and write that macro.
Okay, there was a question. Uh, escape returns an expression, so is interpolation needed? Good question. So if I don't do interpolation here, let's call it simple five, what happens? What does simple five return? Well, that's quite weird. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually returning just the symbol EX2, uh, but it's the symbol EX2 and that get, then gets evaluated in main. And so it's whatever my EX2 was from a long time ago. So no, you definitely do need interpolation here uh, because you want the value of whatever this object is, is to be interpolated into this. Uh, oh, you were saying that I could have just returned EX2 like that. Yes, that's probably true. In this case, that is actually true. You're right. Thanks. Good point. Yeah. But in more general cases, you will need to interpolate the, you know, you'll, you'll be breaking this thing up into pieces and you'll only interpolate some of them, then you need to, you're, you're only escaping some of them, then you'll need to interpolate. Okay, new questions. Why was XX in simple three not replaced with a macro local name? Is it only on the left-hand side of assignments that the replacement is done? Yeah, so Julia is trying to analyze what is a local variable and what is a global variable. Since I did not assign to XX, it treats it as a global variable. It treats it differently. I didn't understand when you recommended a macro immediately call a function with a macro argument. If a function can do the same thing as a macro, why would you use a macro? Great question. Yeah, so uh, a, mac a function cannot do the same thing as a macro, yeah. Okay, maybe I didn't emphasize that enough. And now my neighbors are using a drill. Let me close the window. Okay, so let's just scroll back a bit and see what's happening. So, what does the mac really? What does the macro do? The macro receives this piece of code and it converts it, it parses it into a Julia expression object. That only a macro can do that. And a function cannot do that. What does the function do? The function now receives the, the thing as an expression object. EX here is already, when I'm inside the macro, it is has already been converted into an expression object. And now I'm passing that expression object to this function. That function receives an expression object. Right? The function can never take this piece of code. If I call the function myself, right? remember that I had to explicitly myself convert it into an expression object using this colon. That is what a macro avoids. The macro just takes this string and automatically converts it into an expression object. So thanks, yeah, very important point. Is it correct that macros are only for user-facing code? No library would ever call the macro of another library. That is not correct. Um, there are libraries that use macros from other libraries. Uh, I can't think of a particular example right now, but um, yeah, you can, can definitely use macros in, in libraries and um, you can even use macros inside macros, but that does um, cause some, some issues. Okay. Okay, hopefully this was clear. So now let's do this show exercise. So I want a macro called my show of an expression. And what it's gonna do is immediately call a function, right? Uh, sorry, return the output of the function underscore my show called on that expression. And then I'm going to write the function my underscore my show on an expression and that is supposed to show the expression 
And so it's going to do print line of oh yeah, um, <clears throat> print line of right. So it has to what it what does it have to do? It has to return a piece of code. So the piece of code that it's going to return is something, and that is going to do print line x. And then I need a string, right? And so I'm going to interpolate into that for its string. The value of ex equals ex, I think, something like that. So let's see if that works. So underscore my show of the, the just the symbol x. And so we see that it is doesn't seem to be right, right? Because I'm passing in this expression and it's supposed to, yeah, it's supposed to replace. So this, what I'm, what I'm wanting this to do is, is print line, you know, the symbol X equals the uh, value of X. So definitely I want to interpolate here, right? So I'm here, this dollars is interpolating this piece of code into this piece of code. So when I do that, I get the correct x here. And now the problem is here, there's um, oh, so uh, oh my goodness. Uh, so how do, how do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I need to take it outside the the, 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 the quotes, right? This this dollars ex in here is interpolating into the string. Don't quite want to do that. I, I want something more like this dollars ex comma equals comma ex. So that's going to print print line x equals x. But that's going to give me the value, right? When I run that on my, do I have a variable x? No, let's make a variable x equals 10. When I'm going to run my show on this variable x, I'm going to get the value equals the value. And what I want is the, the name of this object or the, you know, the actual expression itself. And so what I need to do is something new, which is, I need to quote this expression, I believe. So let's do that. So x2 is quote node of ex. So what is quote node? As I have the expression colon x in ex, what is quote node of ex with a capital Q and capital N, that's a Julia type, that actually returns a new expression, which is the expression the symbol x inside. So you see there's an extra sort of level of indirection. There's an extra level of quoting, an extra level of, yeah. So quote here is sort of like you can think of a quote in literature. In literature, you know, you would say, David said, um, hello, right? And the hello would be in double quotes. And this is sort of the same thing. And so um, then you could say, you know, um, Jane said, David said hello, and he would sort of have the hello inside an extra label, layer of double quotes or something like that. This is sort of equivalent to that. And so the point is I need to quote this expression. And so now I need to the value of that expression instead. And when I do that, hopefully it should work. So now I get print line, you know, the um, expression x equals x. Uh, now I'm wondering if I actually need an escape there as well. I probably do. So it's like probably escape of that or something. I don't know. Uh, not sure about that. Okay. And so uh, and now I do actually my, my show of X and I apparently get the right thing. X plus Y. There's no variable Y. Oh, there we go. Yeah. X was 10 and Y was 3. Yeah. So that seems to be doing the right thing. And I'm afraid to admit that I do not know if I need the, the escape or not. Let's try it without the escape. And it probably gives the right thing. It gives the right thing because I'm not modifying it. Yeah, not sure about that. We should discuss that. But this quote node is you know, a new concept that's important when you're trying to distinguish between the value of an expression, right? The point is this expression x that's just, just, just hanging out. Uh, in my show of X. This is getting evaluated by Julia, right? Uh, whereas here, I don't want to evaluate the expression, so I need an extra level of sort of quoting on top. Uh, okay, yeah, this is pretty tricky stuff. And this took me a long time to understand all of this, and so I hope, um, I'm, I hope some of it's becoming clear.
Okay, so now, uh, you know, now we can take some of what we've previously done and put it into macros land, right? So, uh, oh, I don't have that much time left. So here's some exercises you can do at home. Write a macro at replace. It's just going to take the function replace that we wrote before and replace terms in an expression. So we can apply it to something like this, and it will replace x by x plus 1, and we should be able to specify which term to replace and which term to not replace. And so that requires the macro to actually receive several arguments as one of the questions, uh, as a little question about that. And similarly, my macro at checked that replaces in an expression all arithmetic operations with checked operations, just like my at interval macro did, similar to that. Okay. So let's quickly look at macros for domain-specific languages. This is, a, as I said, a very important use case. Now, little domain-specific language is just going to be symbolic variables, as in this great package, Symbolics.jl, that was published recently that I love and I've been using quite a lot, and we'll talk a bit about uh, maybe in a bit. So let's suppose we want to, so what does Symbolics.jl do? It allows me to define symbolic variables, so they basically you know, this is a very simplified version. They basically look like this. Struct variable with a name, which is a symbol. And then I might want to print it out in a pretty way. Okay, so I'm going to define that struct. So now I can construct variables like this, right? So this is a variable whose name is symbolic, a symbolic variable whose name is x. And then I'm going to want to do things like be able to add two of these symbolic variables to get 2x, you know, in a symbolic way. But, but anyway, yeah, so... <clears throat> Now, suppose that we want to define a Julia variable called x that is bound to this variable object. So we need to write x equals variable of colon x. That's what we would need to write. And of course, that is ugly. It's nasty. And so we want to make it nicer for the user to write, right? Why is it nasty? Because I'm repeating the same x twice, right? I want these x's to be the same. So if I want, if I have a variable called hello, I would want it to do, to do this. And I'd have to type hello twice or type my long variable name twice. And that is just is nasty for the user to have to do that. So it's similar to the show macro, at show macro. What we would like to be able to do is write something like at var x, that is sort of declaring that, oh, x should be a variable. And so basically, it's kind of, you know, you can think of basically the user has in their head this idea that they want to declare things. I want to declare that x is a variable. But then somehow somebody needs to convert that into the actual code that you need to write down, which in this case is that, oh, I need to create a, ver a, a Julia object called x. And it is of type variable, but I also need the x inside that variable name. Uh, right, so this is kind of transferring, it's kind of often what these macros are used for in domain specific languages is actually kind of converting declarative programming into imperative programming. So declarative programming here, I'm declaring that x should be a variable, and then I'm converting it into the imperative code that makes x behave like a variable, something like that. Okay, so try writing this macro uh, at var. Right, so maybe I'll give you two or three minutes to do that. Okay, so um, 
There was a question, when would we like to do more in a macro than just pass the captured expression by the macro to a function? And then my answer would be never. You should always just immediately pass it to a function. Many macros and packages are not written like this because it just adds more code. But um, yeah, uh, and if you're, you know, if you're happy enough developing macros without having this ability to just run the code to see what, you know, what expression is being output, that's the problem, right? Macros don't immediately allow you to, to, to see what expression they're actually creating. You can use add macro expand. So maybe, maybe that's the answer. You don't actually need to do that because you can just use add macro expand and then you see without manually running the function what's going on. But I think it's just cleaner to have this separate function. Okay, let's do this at var macro. Let's see if I can write it. So uh, need a macro var and we're going to just immediately you know, return underscore var of x. And then we want to write this function underscore var of x that makes this code. And so it's going to return something like ex. And I'm going to need to escape that, right? Because I'm creating a something in my global or in my in the in the scope that I'm calling the macro from. I want to create this variable. So I definitely need to escape that. Where, where am I? I lost my um, so I need to escape that copy of ex so that that one is evaluated in, in the scope that I'm calling it from. And then I want variable of quote node of ex. A quote node because I need to quote it again, right? Uh, so let's, let's try that. So if I call add var of x, I get this escaped version of x equals variable of quote node of ex. And I need to actually interpolate that, right? Because I have ex here. I don't want ex. Uh, there we go. Variable of x. And now if I do add var, so x right now is, oh, it already, uh, let's call it something else. So z, is that exist? OK, I don't have a z right now. So add var of z, I want z to be a variable. Is z a variable? Yes. So I correctly. Uh, made z i correctly you know introduced this new ob object called z this new binding variable binding called z by because this code was compiled in global scope right so at macro expand at var of z what does that do z equals main dot variable of colon z so yeah it seems to be doing the right thing so here I use meta.quote instead. That's, that's something slightly different. I maybe, uh, I don't remember if that actually worked or not. But I think I ended up using this quote there. So let me remove this meta.quote. Sorry about that. Yeah. And again, yeah, I like this, I like this uh, version of it where I actually defined escaped ex is escape and then quoted ex is quote node of ex. Personally, I find that this makes it much more readable and easy to understand, easier to understand what's going on. Okay, great. So now, what about several variables? So this is the answer to the question about multiple arguments in macros. So how do I handle something like, oh, I want to be able to call add var to make x and y simultaneously two different separate variables, one called x and one called y. Right. So the first task to work out is what actually happens when the macro gets something like this. So let's go back to our simplest macro, favorite macro that does nothing. And let's pass two arguments in. And what happens? Nothing or rather an error. And it's a very cryptic error. No method matching var at simple blah, 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 blah. So what this is actually trying to tell you is that you need a method of the macro that takes in two arguments. Right. Here, it seems like it takes in four arguments. That's because this is like a desugaring de or lowering of the macro. The macro is actually being called like this. And you can actually call the macro like that yourself, as I uh, explained at the bottom, thanks to Simeon Schaub for that uh, point. Anyway, this is crypt cryptically telling you that you need two, uh, you know, a version of the macro with two arguments. So here, how do you define that? You define it like this, just as if it were a function. These are, but these are expressions, remember. There are either expressions or things like symbols. And so when I do this, and now I call at simple x, y, here I'm seeing, oh, yes, x, ex1 is the first argument, and ex2 is the second argument. 
You can also define macros with var args with a dot, dot, dot. Um, so here, here we go. So this is a version of the, mac the, the at var macro, which will take an arbitrary number of arguments, right? So, um, so what do I need to do for each argument in this list, in this vector? I need to call, right? So first of all, what we need to do is show what we actually get, right? Let's just show what we actually get when we call it. Um, we just get a tuple, actually. So this is not a vector, it's a tuple, right? Um, Julia always collects things with dot, 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 var args, right? Var args, that means variable number of arguments. Uh, variadic argument, I think it's something called, okay? Uh, so that gives me a tuple. So now what I'm doing is iterating over that tuple. So for x in ex in exs, in this set of expressions, I'm gonna call this function. So this is a perfect example of how suddenly the fact that I had already separated it into the function is, uh, is excellent because now I can just call that function for each one of these things. So this function is returning the relevant piece of code that I want that defines each of these variables separately. Okay, and then I'm going to um, show what I get out of that. So now I'm gonna run it. And what I get is actually a vector of expressions and those expressions, each one of those defines its relevant variable, right? And so, um, so now how can, I, how can I take that vector of expressions and put it all together into something? I have to combine it somehow. One way to do that is like this. Um, so I have several expressions, one after the other. So one way, a nice way to do that maybe is with a quote block. So a quote end just makes an empty block and then I insert the arguments as the reduction of vcat with all of these uh, things. And so um, that finally does actually do the correct thing. So if I do at macro expand uh, of at var xy, and you see that the code that got generated is this code, right? So it's quote end and just one after the other, all of these statements that are defining these new variables. Another question. If we're going to immediately call a function, is there a simple one line syntax for that? Like func of x equal x squared for functions. Um, oh, good question, I see. The question is, can I just write macro that equals something? That's it, I actually don't know, I don't think so. Why do you interpolate outside quote node and not inside? Um, because uh, I want the the whole value of the quote node thing to be, that's the quote node itself is what I need to put into the expression. How do you get a list of methods of a macro? Methods of that time does not work. It does not. Mm, don't actually know that. Uh, good question, don't know. That would be nice. Okay, and then, so if you look at symbolics, uh, if you actually load the symbolics package, their, their macro is called add variables. When I do add variables of x, y, firstly, you can, you are allowed to put a comma in. That will actually not work um, with, with my version because comma will actually make a tuple. And so you need to analyze the tuple. So what is this actually returning? Result equals that type of result. It's actually returning a vector of those variables. So, uh, so that's being displayed nicely because I'm in the, the, the notebook. Otherwise, it would just display a normal Julia vector of these variables. So, you know, make a version that does that. Right? Currently, I'm not returning the vector of variables that I created. That would be a nice addition. Okay. And then finally, what about actually creating vectors of variables? So again, in symbolics, what I can do is add variables x one to five and it will actually generate, well, now, it's, they changed it recently, now it generates a, an, a, a, a vector, a sort of symbolic vector object. But if I collect those, uh, if I call that vars equals that, I collect vars, uh, you can see that it actually created, oh, uh, sorry. Um, no, this is a bit complicated. So it actually reduce, it returns a vector of all other things that, see, let's get the first element of that. 
That is just that that is this set of symbolic variables, and when I collect those, I get x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Okay. Um, so that would be nice to be able to do. So as we as I already said, well, now what I have to do is actually check the expression to see if which form it has, right? I can't any longer assume that it's just a single symbol. Actually, I already assumed that, right? I should actually be checking that, of course. I should, you know, have a lot of error checking and and tell the user a useful message if they do the wrong thing, et cetera. But now I'm actually gonna have to check the structure of the expression, right? So if I want something of this, this type, well, that has a different head as we've already established. And so I need to actually do an if else, if else, if else, checking all these different heads and then basically um, calling different functions for each option, right? So here I would have a function called, you know, parse multiple variables or create multiple variables or something. And that would then call the underscore var that we already have and um, et cetera. So exercise, make all this work, right? So as you see, it sort of starts becoming a lot of work, but the beautiful thing is that, you know, then as a user, you can just type this at variables x1 to five and, and magically you get, you declared that you have five variables and they just spring into being in the correct way, which otherwise requires you to, to write things like this, right? Um, x equals an array of num of uh, sim real of uh, x comma i for i and one to five, I think is the correct thing. No, it's not the correct thing. Symbolic stop sim. There we go. So you'd have to do something like that, right? So basically, this at variables x one to five is being it, it, it is giving me syntactic sugar for this annoying thing that you know it, it's difficult to remember exactly which order all of the punctuation goes in, basically. And so that is the really the point of macros, in, in my opinion. Okay, so we have very few minutes left. Let's um, let's look quickly at using eval for code generation. So um, if you have a piece of code, just a null, an expression like we've been dealing with, code equals x equals three, then I can just write eval of code and it will evaluate that as if you had typed this piece of code into global scope. And so in this case, what it will do is, you know, evaluate this code x equals three and then x will have the value three. So this is an alternative mechanism to macros. Macros are, you know, we just wrote a macro that does something like this. Now I'm using eval instead, and eval is actually um, somehow worse and somehow more powerful, or I don't know. Uh, yeah, so that has a side effect of running this code at, you know, and basically the point is that you, you can take a piece of code, manipulate it, and then run eval on it, and that will evaluate the, this new piece of code, uh, you know, sort of somehow at runtime. So why is this useful? Well, we can generate copy-pasted code. So here's an example. Suppose I want to have a wrapper type around a floating point number, let's call it my float, which has the value of the float and the number of times that it, it has been used. I just want to keep track of the number of times it's used. So of course, I'm going to construct uh, one of these things by saying that it hasn't been used yet zero times. And then we're going to define the sum of two such numbers with something like this piece of code. So the sum of x and y, which are my floats, and it's going to increment the counts stored inside each of x and y by one, and then return a new value, which is also a my float with a count of zero. So let's try that. Uh, so z equals x plus y. Once I've done that, what is x? x has actually changed, and it knows that it has already been used once, right? Okay, so this is, you know, this is the simplest thing I could think of. And it's kind of kind of cute that it's kind of easy to do that in Julia. <clears throat> but the problem is that now I want to do it with plus, minus, times, and divide. So of course, what you immediately think of doing is just copy pasting the code. So here we go. I have to change this plus, and now I run the code, and I do x minus y, and I get the wrong answer. And the, the, why do I get the wrong answer? Because I forgot to change this plus to a minus as well. So you can see that copy pasting code is dangerous because usually you'll have to change something in many places. And so instead of copy pasting code, we want to actually automate this 
for all of these different functions. You know, in this case, there are only four, but suppose it was sine, cos, x, tan, you know, uh, all of the sort of special functions, et cetera. You don't want to do that by hand. So how do you do it automatically? So what we need to do is uh, we're going to define op, the operator, to be the symbol plus. And then we're going to write the same function that we did before. So let's write that using op here. Uh, so we could write it like this, uh, you would, might think. So let's remove the quote end. And uh, yeah, so this is not actually work, right? So you can't just say base dot op and, and hope that it will actually um, modify the plus function. So you actually have to do this by, by making this a piece of code. So once it's a piece of code, this needs to be a symbol, and then I need to interpolate that here into this piece of code and interpolate it here into that piece of code as well. Now, when I do that, I get, and let's remove the line numbers from that piece of code, and I get the correct, and I, I check, oh yeah, I get the correct piece of code, great. Now what I can do is just iterate over the different, uh, but for op in this tuple of operations, I'm going to do this x, x each time, and I'm going to evaluate x. And when I do that, uh, that didn't work. I need a colon here. And that, that works. And so now when I do x minus y, I get the correct thing. And when I do x times y, it also works. And x divided by also works. OK, x times y didn't work. Why is that? <laughs> I have no idea why that didn't work. Oh, dear. Hmm. Okay, this did not work. Uh, uh, why not? Oh, yeah. Oh. No, I, I'm not sure why that didn't work, but um, maybe it will work if I use at eval instead. Oh, I didn't want the, I, then I don't want the quote end. No? Oh, dear. Mm hmm. I don't want to return. Oh, yeah, no, I do want to return. Uh, this, does this version work? Yes, this version works. I'm not sure what the difference is. Base dot dollars. Oh, OK, base dot dollars. No, no colon there, sorry. Is that the problem? No, I don't want the parenthesis there. Or there. I'm not sure what's going on. This version works. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm almost out of time. So yeah, so there's this, when we use eval, there's this big problem called world age errors. So that occurs when you have code like this. Here I'm defining an expression inside a function, and then I'm evaling it inside the function that's going to create a function g at global scope. Eval always works at global, global scope. And then I'm trying to call that function that I just generated, that I just created, inside the same function. And when I do that, I get this infamous world age error, right? So that is a mechanism that's beautifully explained in a talk that I linked somewhere right there, this video by Julia Belyakova. Um, uh, and then maybe, yeah, maybe, uh, there's going to be a keynote uh, by somebody whose name I temporarily forgot, Jan Vitek, uh, who has worked on this. Uh, that, that was his his group. And uh, so he, he may talk about this. Anyway, it's, it's annoying. And so there are various ways around it, which I explain here. I won't go through them. And I'll just briefly comment about the other two notebooks. One is about generated functions. There's a sort of specialized topic, which is about getting really high performance functions 
And so uh, basically there's an example of multiplying two polynomials where you want to unroll code. You want to replace a for loop with just a sequence of statements that effectively does the for loop explicitly um, with no need to check each time. The problem in the for loop is you're checking each time, have I finished yet? And so here, what we do is we actually generate the unrolled code um, that does the, the multiplications of the coefficients of the polynomial. So you can read through that. And then uh, at the end, there's just this alternative techniques and more advanced methods. So symbolics.jl is useful because you can actually trace through functions. So here's a Julia function, f of x, y. And then here are symbolic variables. And I just pass the symbolic variables into the function. And I get back the structure of the function. Right, so basically, one of the problems with metaprogramming is if I define a Julia function like this, you probably want to say, well, how do I get back the code that I use to define the function? And the answer is you can't. You cannot get back exactly this code as far as I'm aware. Um, and so instead, what you can get back is what's called a lowered form uh, and intermediate representation. So you get back this form, which is the same as the original code, except you've introduced these in these new variables, basically, at each node in the expression tree that we looked at before, you're introducing these new variables. And this is a simplified version of the code in something called SSA, static single assignment form. And um, this is the form that you, you can actually get access to of your function. But um, symbolics sort of allows you to recover the original function as long as it satisfies some requirements. And this is very useful, in, in at least in mathematical contexts, uh, where you're really dealing with mathematical functions that look uh, that are sort of evaluations of variables like this. And so I've used that, and many people have used that, and Modeling Toolkit is taking that to a real, real, uh, adv really advanced level for specifying problems symbolically, uh, et cetera. There are various tools that, that deal with things at this level of the intermediate representation. So cassette.jr is one of them. IR tools is another. I'm not going to talk about what they are. Um, but they're basically kind of more advanced ways of, of doing metaprogramming, but you have to do it at this, un, at this lower level code, which is more difficult and more annoying to manipulate, in my opinion, but it's more powerful. And then ML style has high performance pattern matching that makes it easier to match and extract pieces of ASTs. So you don't have to do this checking the head in, in the same way, and it's, it's just gonna be easier to extract pieces of code and macro tools there's an older package that does the same thing. So let me finish. Uh, I hope uh, that this workshop has been useful. Metaprogramming is a powerful tool that's therefore dangerous. It's useful in specific circumstances to make you know, the user, to, to make it so that the user has to type in less of this sort of stuff that Julian needs to create objects, basically. Uh, to create objects with all kinds of default arguments, et cetera. It's, um, it's, it's a very interesting, quite sometimes infuriating and sort of annoying subject. Um, but if you need it, hopefully this was useful. I really recommend you check out the resources that I linked. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm you know, very happy to hear feedback uh, on the metaprogramming channel in Slack or on Discord now, the JuliaCon Discord. Uh, okay, so thanks everybody for sticking with me. Have a good day. Bye.